Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our sixth United Nations 2030 Challenge Seminar, Healthier Lives and Wellbeing for All, uh, Sustainable Development Goal number three. In the context of world health issues, including COVID, I believe it's important to see what new thinking and actions we can take locally to make a positive difference. And this session is around health and well-being within the context of Lincolnshire and beyond. We are delighted and very thankful to have Professor Derek Ward leading his seminar. Derek is the Director of Public Health for Lincolnshire and he took over the role in February 2018. He is a Fellow of the Faculty of Public Health, a Fellow of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Society of Public Health and the East Midlands Clinical Public Health Research Lead for the National Institute for Health Research. He is also a Visiting Professor of Public Health at the University of Lincoln Medical School. Thank you, Derek, for your time and your support for this event. I hand over to you. Thank you, Clive. Thank you, Bert. Um, good afternoon. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing the time, uh, considering the football and all. Um, so if everybody looks left or right, I'll know why somebody scored. You'll have to give me a <laughs> shout. Um, I'm really pleased to, to talk through a little bit about um, the, the healthy lives and well-being for all uh, approach. Specifically, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. Uh, one is just to give a little bit of an overview about well, what public health is. Um, we have never been so popular at, as we are at the moment, um, but I think it's important to recognise that we have been going for, for, for a long time um, and that we cover a broad range of different issues, not just uh, health protection and the COVID response. So I'll give a little bit of an overview of that. I'll talk a little bit about um, specifically public health in local government, which is what my role encompasses, although we work very closely with the NHS and wider partners. And then because this is a, a challenge event and it's about um, thinking a little bit differently, I'm going to talk about uh, a WHO programme called the Global Burden of Disease. And most specifically, what the global burden of disease when applied to Lincolnshire tells us and why and if that's important. And I think that hopefully will stimulate a bit of a conversation um, about how we set our health and social care services up and maybe how we should do it in the future. So I shall just share my screen now. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, give me a wave just to confirm you can see that. OK, yeah, great. Thank you very much. OK, um, so um, I'll just put that over there. What is public health? Um, lots and lots of definitions of public health. Uh, I, I won't read through them. But for me, um, the, the definition of, of public health is intrinsically tied to the definition of uh, the National Health Service. And, and I guess I would argue, and not, not in a negative way, that the National Health Service isn't a National Health Service, it is a National Sickness Service. What we have is, uh, in my view, and I think this is backed up by um, WHO, the UN, uh, and a lot of other agencies, one of the best uh, sickness services in the world, in terms of when somebody has an illness, um, we respond in... Uh, um, from a clinical perspective in some of the best ways of anywhere in the world. What we don't perhaps do as well is we don't keep people fit and healthy in the first place. Um, and the fundamental point of public health, there's more than one, but the fundamental point of public health is about keeping people fit and healthy for as long as possible. And then when people do have a condition, minimizing the impact of that condition, both in terms of their general life and also in terms of stopping it getting any worse. So, so that's that's the role of public health. Um, we've been handed backwards and forwards between the NHS and local government since our inception, really. But um, and, and it's a whole different lecture about the history of public health. Uh, but if we if we look at the most recent history, we were part of local government before uh, before 1972, and then we moved into the NHS, and then from uh, from that period through to 2012-2013. Uh, um, we were in the NHS, so I've been an executive director in the NHS as well as now uh, a chief officer of the council, and then we moved back into a council. And I'll cover a little bit why, of, of why it's important, and, and I think predominantly public health struggles both, and it's important that we do. 
So public health is about the health of, of people and communities and an important distinction here. I don't know whether you've had many uh, sort of NHS uh, clinically trained people on, on these calls, but when, when you're trained in a clinical discipline, your job is to provide the best health and care to the person in front of you that you can. My job is fundamentally different to that. My job is to try to provide the best health and care to a population. And that brings with it some, some interesting and difficult challenges, uh, not, not least the fact that um, we have a finite resource, and I'll come on to the money in a minute. But because we've got a finite resource, that means you, um, I have to stop individual clinicians giving the maximum um, health and care to an individual because the benefit of the spend of that money spent elsewhere could actually produce a bigger benefit to the health and well-being of the population. And, that, and that's quite an important distinction and a fundamental distinction between uh, public health and other clinical dis disciplines. Um, as I said, it, public health, we tend to break it down to three broad areas. Um, health protection is the one that everybody's very interested in now um, with COVID-19. Uh, and it's got two, two core areas. Health improvement is a, a fundamental area, and it's where a lot of the work that, that we've done historically around uh, stop smoking services, around um, healthy weight uh, is located. And then the third area that not a lot of people outside of the NHS and public health say, but really, really important is healthcare. And healthcare is about um, supporting, working with our NHS colleagues to make sure that the care that they provide is, is optimal, but also challenging them, also saying, no, that's not the best care. We need to change how we do these things. Um, and that will speak to the, the main part of my presentation, I think. So health protection, um, COVID is, is obviously a, a key area at the moment, and that's around infectious disease control. Um, we have been doing this since uh, Victorian times. In fact, you can go back and talk about the bubonic plague and, and every pandemic um, highlights uh, health inequalities, which we'll come on to when we talk about health improvement. But infectious diseases, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's measles, mumps and rubella, or whether it is uh, TB, and we, we have plenty of TB in Lincolnshire and across uh, the UK, and we deal with uh, TB cases normally on a weekly basis in Lincolnshire. So um, lots of diseases that people think don't exist anymore do exist. And part of the role of public health is to make sure that we are uh, dealing with them and that the individuals who are suffering from those diseases are getting the best NHS care and support. But we also deal with a much broader range of issues. Um, as you can see there, uh, chemical and poisons, um, radiation, uh, emergency response. If we have a, a major fire, then often I'll get a call, or one of my consultants will get a call, uh, just in case the fire service aren't too sure what's in the plume and whether there's an impact on, on the health and wellbeing of people and they'll ask for our advice and support. And also, also environmental health hazards. Uh, before I started, uh, but I, I, some of you may know, I understand we had a whale that washed up on one of our beaches. Um, and there was a question there about, uh, is there an impact on uh, human health there? So uh, it's never a dull moment in, in my job, uh, that's for sure. So health protection is one of the three core domains. Health improvement, um, I, I tend to joke a little bit about this and say health improvement is the bit that I um, put my finger and, and wag it at people and say, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't drink alcohol. You shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't eat fatty foods. You shouldn't do this, that, and the other. Um, completely the wrong way to do it. What we should be doing, and we try to do in Lincolnshire at least, is say, by maintaining a healthy weight, by being physically active, look at all these benefits. But it's really, really important. Um, and uh, smoking, as we'll come on and we'll see later on, is still one of this, the, the biggest drivers of ill health. Probably balanced, if not overbalanced at the moment, by people who don't maintain a healthy weight. So this really important fundamental part of public health, but also a really difficult one to deliver because telling people what not to do is, is one sure way to get people to slam the door in your face. So, so we have to pitch that differently. But health improvement also covers wider, wider issues and wider determinants of health as we call it. So we work really closely with our education colleagues uh, in schools, um, 
we work very closely with our district colleagues around housing because the quality of housing is fundamental to people's health and well-being. Um, and we need to work, and we have worked with COVID, for example, around engaging people um, in their community life and making sure that they've got community support, community cohesion and connectedness. We've, we've all been talking about social isolation, haven't we? Well, that's, that's really an oxymoron. We don't want social isolation. What we want is physical distancing whilst we maintain social connection. And, and that's one of the challenges that we've had with, with COVID that connects the role of health protection in public health with the role of health improvement. And that actually brings us on to healthcare because we need to be looking at how we provide the right health services dependent upon the needs of the people of, of Lincolnshire in my responsibility, but the needs of the country and, and the needs of the world. And um, health clinicians are fantastic at doing the job they are trained to do, but they are very, very busy and it's very difficult for them to take a step back and look up and look a little bit wider. And part of the fundamental role of public health and director of public health is to help our NHS colleagues, both from a, a strategic perspective, but also from an operational perspective to do that. Um, and so we work very closely with our NHS colleagues. We work um, on making sure that the spend that they have is the most effective and efficient, that how they plan and deliver services meets the needs of the population in Lincolnshire. We are very large, very uh, spread out, um, very rural county with, as you all know, not the greatest of um, road networks and connections. And so how you deliver uh, NHS services in, in a place like Lincolnshire is very different to how you deliver them in somewhere like Derby City, which is where I was director of public health previously, because you can basically walk across Derby City. It is a very compact population um, of a quarter of a million people. Lincolnshire is three quarters of a million people spread over a much, much bigger area. And um, we need to think and deliver differently on that, which will come on to the, the challenge part of the conversation. Um, I thought it was useful to get some money in here because um, people tend not to realise how much we spend on the NHS. So uh, just a few figures. Um, plan spent for the Department of Health and Social Care in 2021 is um, £212 billion pounds for one year. Now that's thousand million, it's not million million, it's thousand million, we're using the American one, but it's 212,000 million pounds that we spend through the Department of Health and Social Care. Now that's inflated because of COVID response, but in a normal year, it's still about 150 billion pounds. Of that 150 in a normal year, about 130 goes to NHS England, and NHS England are the ones who commission NHS services, you know, clues in the title. Um, and the majority of that goes to local clinical commissioning groups, and they're the local, for us it's Lincolnshire, um, they're the local NHS body that buy services from the hospitals or from the GPs or from other places. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of, of how that, that funding flows. Vast majority um, is spent on the NHS. Of that, normally 150 billion. Um, Public Health England, uh, in the news quite a lot at the moment, um, get 4 billion. So of 150 billion, we spend four normally on public health. And of that four, three of it comes to local authority. So of the total spend that the Department of Health has, they give public health in Lincolnshire the equivalent of 1.6%. And that's spread across all places. Um, now, don't get me wrong, that's a reasonable amount. For, for Lincolnshire, it's about 33 and a half million pounds that I have direct responsibility and I have to spend. And um, we'll come on to what I spend it on. Um, but when you compare that to what the NHS in Lincolnshire get, 1.3 billion, and I've got 33 million. So we've got 1.3 billion treating sickness, and we've got 33 million trying to stop people get sick in the first place. Um, it always reminds me of the old Benjamin Franklin quote, an answer prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I'm sure everybody here will not, and yet we don't spend our money that way. We just do not do it that way. We spend all our money curing illness, 
uh, and there's a parable about that that I can go into later if, if we want, but th there, is, th there are understandable reasons why we do that, but it's not the right way to do it. Um, so local authorities, we've got 33 million in Lincolnshire. What do we do with it? Um, a few acronyms, apologies. NCMP, National Child Measurement Programme, that's the height and weight measurement programme we do in schools for in, in reception year and year six. So we know how what proportion of our children are a healthy weight and what aren't. We commission a number of NHS services. So NHS health checks we commission as a council and we get GP practices to deliver. And, and NHS health checks is when people are over 40 and they get every five years a, a, a check with a GP practice, normally with a, um, a it might be a practice nurse, it might be somebody else, about height and weight and, and risk for cardiovascular disease. But we also commission things like sexual health services. Um, and so we, we do commission dedicated specialist NHS services, but we do it from a local authority perspective. We have a statutory responsibility to provide advice and support into the NHS. We have statutory responsibility to provide health protection services although predominantly that's led by Public Health England, soon to become fully embedded in the UK Health Security Agency. So, um, and we, all, we have a number of other statutory responsibilities that sit in other legislation. For example, we, um, we are statutorily responsible to commission alcohol and substance misuse services for people who have quite severe um, disease. And that, that's aligned to some of the Home Office uh, statutes. So that's what we do directly, we have to do. Then we need to deliver our health improvement, health protection and healthcare services. And in, in Lincolnshire, my role is actually a bit wider than, than the standard director of public health role. So I have broad responsibilities for um, the, the uh, upper tier authority, uh, the, the county council's role in housing. Um, we support carers, because if we took away all the carers in Lincolnshire tomorrow, the NHS would fall over in a second. So would local government, everybody would fall over because we just couldn't afford to support all the people that are formal and informal carers support day in, day out. So we try to support the people who support. Um, we telecare um, and telecare is one area that we're actually about to go out and recommission because we've got an analog system in a digital age for telecare. It's a very, very, very old fashioned system and there's a huge amount we can do better. And we also commission some areas that uh, some services that most other places don't do. One being the wellbeing service and this is sort of low level support. So for people who need some support but not, not so much that they need a carer or they need somebody in from social care or they need somebody in from like a district nurse, we, we will provide advice and support to help them live a better life at home and to hopefully stop them needing further care and support so they can live as independently for as long as possible. So the, they're the things that, um, that we do in local government. I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes talking about, um, so that's what we do. How do we know what we should do? And there's a fundamental thing here that we, we need to talk about. There's a fundamental distinction between what people demand in, not, not, in, not in a negative way, but the demand for health and care services and the need for health and care services. And, and what we talk about in public health is something called the inverse care law. And, and what, that, one, what that says is those people who are the most educated, the most articulate, um, they know who to ask and they know what to ask for and they tend to get it. And the people at the other end don't know who to ask, don't know what they should be asking for and don't get it. And unfortunately, it's the people at the other end who are the ones who actually need it. And it's the most articulate, the most um, eloquent, the most educated, who probably don't need it, but do demand it. And it skews our resources, skews how we deliver health and social care services. And we need to try and shift that back. And that is one of the key drivers of health inequality. That's why we have 10, 12, 15 years difference in life expectancy between our most affluent populations and our least affluent and as importantly that amount or even more difference in our healthy life expectancy how long we can expect to live before we're dealing with with illness 
So the global burden of disease is something that the World Health Organization has now adopted and a lot of countries have adopted uh, and the UK government has adopted. Um, but quite recently, only um, 2019, were the data available at a sub-national level. So we got those data for Lincolnshire for 20, in 2019, the data is a couple of years old, um, but it's really important and I'll come on to describe why. The fundamental point of um, the global burden of disease that's different is, historically we've set up our NHS, our sickness services, based on what people die from. And that's understandable. When somebody dies, a medic will say, this was the cause of death. And so we know what people die from. And so it's perfectly rational that we say, we need to put a service in place that tackles the things that people die from. Perfectly reasonable. And we've done a fantastic job of reducing the number of people who die from different conditions. I'll come on to that. But we don't tend to set our services up to deal with the things that people live with, but their impact upon their health. And secondly, it's very, very difficult to compare and contrast two things. So if we have 100 people who die from a heart, heart disease in Lincolnshire over a year, how does that compare to 1,000 people who have migraine, migraines over a year in Lincolnshire? And if we've got a million pounds to spend, but we can only spend it in one or the other, where do we spend it? Now, the majority of people would say, well, you, you save those 100 lives. But do, is that right? Do we know whether that's right? Has anybody actually asked the question? Global burden of disease is the first and only methodology that tries to compare different conditions with each other using a standardized measure. Come on to that in a minute. And it also tries to compare people who live with chronic diseases against people who lose their lives from acute diseases. And so it gives us a different way to look at the data. There is no right and wrong on this. This is about informing, having a more evidence-informed debate about how we spend about £1.3 billion that Lincolnshire gets every year for NHS services. But for me, this is the best, most up-to-date, um, most interesting way to, to look at it. Uh, I won't go through the background, but it, it doesn't cover everything, but it covers the, the, the main bases. Um, we can compare Lincolnshire to the, the, the other upper tier authorities across the country, but we can equally compare Lincolnshire to um, the USA, for example, because it standardises against um, population. So you don't have to worry about how big the population is. You don't even have to worry about the age demographic because Lincolnshire is an older population. We can standardise for that. So it gives us a different, a different way to look at the data. Um, this will get a bit complicated, so I'll skim over it. Happy to, to have this as part of the conversation, because I think the conversation will be more, more important. The, over, the overarching measure for global burden disease is called the disability adjusted life years. And, and a disability adjusted life year, a DALI, is made up of two things. How many years of life are lost from a disease, plus how many years does somebody live with that disease before they die and what is the impact of that disease for living um, with it and then you add those two together and then you get an, a, a, a dally for that disease so that that's the basics of it there's lots of other measures out there um, but for me dallies dallies are the way to go because we can compare deaths with the impact on people's lives and that's really important so what what did the global burden of disease tell us in Lincolnshire. Um, I, I, I've changed these around a little bit because I think it's quite important to, just to look at it. As I said, the NHS is predominantly set up on what people die from. And when you look at the burden of disease approach in Lincolnshire for what people die of and how many years of healthy life they have lost, and there's a reference population, but, but you know, if somebody dies at 60, they've lost 80, uh, they've lost 20 odd years of healthy, of, of healthy life because generally they should live into their 80s depending on which reference population you look at. And that's how it's calculated. Um, but when you look at what people are dying from, it's not really massively surprising. Um, heart disease, lung cancer, stroke, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's might be a surprise for people. People die from Alzheimer's. 
And I'm not sure a lot of the people of Lincolnshire would recognise that or, 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 or understand it. Other cancers are on there. And number nine is self-harm. And self-harm predominantly, in terms of years of life lost, is driven by deaths uh, through suicide. And predominantly, whilst we don't, fortunately, we don't have a large number, we do sadly still have some deaths by suicide. Uh, it tends to be younger people who, who, who die through that approach. Um, and so they're actually losing a lot of their life because they're dying young. And that then raises it up the priority list. But generally, years of life loss, not a big surprise. Um, years live with disability, I think might be a surprise to people. Number one is lower back pain. You know, uh, hands up how many of us have suffered from lower back pain and how many of us understand just how disabling that can be whilst it's really in the acute phase. Um, number two is headache disorders. So migraines are, are a real driver. And this, is, this pattern isn't that different to most of the uh, market economy countries. Uh, we're not particularly different. There's a few differences, but not massively. Um, depression. People generally don't die of depression. And what that's meant is our NHS tends to focus on our acute hospital, our A&E. It doesn't really focus as much, in my opinion, as it should do on our mental health services, nor does it focus as much on what can we do to keep people mentally fit and healthy. We've had more of that with COVID actually, more of a focus on how do we keep people fit and healthy going through what is a hopefully once in a, a century pandemic experience. Number four is back, uh, neck pain. So you've got back pain number one, number four neck pain. You add those two together, it's a really big driver of our a disability, the impact on people's lives. And then I won't run through the rest because you can see those, but we've got, we've got two musculoskeletal conditions, low back pain, neck pain, and we've got um, depressive disorders and, and anxiety disorders in the top 10 as well. And I would argue, and I'll come on to argue, that our NHS, not just in Lincolnshire, across the country, is not set up. Our spend of our 1.3 billion is not proportionate to reflect just how important musculoskeletal conditions and mental ill health conditions are in terms of the impact on the people of Lincolnshire. Now remember that years of life loss and years of live with disability, you've got to add them together to get your dally. Add them together to get your dally. Ischemic heart disease is still number one. So we've still got to tackle heart disease, but lower back pain is number two. And, and basically it's a mix then. And I think some on that list, I would be really confident that we can say our NHS is set up to deal with. Some on that list, I would say the public health division we are asked to deal with. Some on that list, not at all. And that for me is a fundamental challenge that we've got to put back into our health and social care system about how we're going to change what we do so that we can start to address all of those on the list. Now, a, a couple of slides, lots of detail in here. Uh, so again, I won't try to go through it, um, but this is what they call a, a, a box chart, um, sometimes a tree chart. The total of the three colors is the total number of dallies in Lincolnshire. So it's everything, what everybody dies of in a year, uh, and this is for 2017, what everybody lives with, it's everything. And the three different colours represent three broad categories in the global burden of disease. Blue is non-communicable diseases. And if you looked at South Sahara and Africa, um, the, the red and the green would be much bigger boxes and the blue would be much littler because the box doesn't change in terms of size, the proportions change. But in, in the UK and in Lincolnshire, fairly standard um, looking approach. The strength of the colour, and I'm not sure if you'll get this through Zoom, the strength of the colour, the darker colours are the ones that are getting worse over time. The lighter colours are the ones that are getting better. Getting better as in they're not as bad as they were. They're, they're still a big box. So cardiovascular disease, CVD, top left corner on my screen, is a big box, but it's getting lighter. 
neoplasms is cancers, is the middle box, sort of in the middle. MSK, third biggest block, getting darker. Musculoskeletal condition is not only a big issue that we don't really address, it's getting worse. So that, that's a visual, visual um, way to look at it. And I realize people are on little screens and you probably can't see the detail. Um, so I won't go through the next slide in detail, but just, just watch the screen. We go down a level. So they're very, you know, cardiovascular disease is a really big category. So what does that mean? Well, it means ischemic heart disease. It means stroke. AFib is atrial fibrillation. That's something we can stop. If we detect it, we can make sure people don't suffer negative health impacts of atrial fibrillation. True of stroke predominantly as well. We know what, what we should be doing around stroke. And um, this is coming down a level which is more helpful for when we commission services because we don't commission cardiovascular disease services. We commission a stroke pathway, for example. So, so it helps us, but it also helps us when we look at um, impacts. And, and one thing, I don't know whether you'll be able to see this. I don't know whether you can see my cursor. I'm on the green, I'm around falls. Falls is pretty big and it's dark. And the vast majority of people wouldn't think it was an, uh, an issue. I, I mean, if you've fallen or you've got somebody who's fallen, then you will. But it's actually a really important area that we need to tackle. Alzheimer's, really big area. Remember we were talking about people die from Alzheimer's. Um, and you'll see there we've got self-harm as well. So that's Dally's. I'm going to just jump through these. We've got these slides as well for years living with disability. So this isn't what people are dying from. This is what people are living with. And you'll see cardiovascular diseases up there because people have angina and they live with angina. Um, but you'll see suddenly musculoskeletal conditions is massive. Diabetes and chronic kidney disease is much bigger and is getting worse. Unintentional injuries, really big issue in terms of what people live with. So that, can, that could be, for example, a younger person has a road traffic accident and needs really detailed support and care for the rest of their life because they've got maybe uh, they suffer brain damage. So, so these, are, these are really significant issues that generally, if you just look at what people die from, you don't see, you miss it. And then come down a level again. I've already talked a little bit about what are our top 10 dallies and ischemic heart disease is number one. I won't go into the details of what a disability adjusted life year is, but in effect, it's a year of healthy life lost. So in 2017, 18 and a half thousand healthy years were lost to the people of Lincolnshire because of ischemic heart disease. But 14 and a half thousand were lost because of lower back pain. The vast majority of the lower back pain could have been avoided. And this is where it becomes really important to then consider what and how do we intervene as a health and social care system, as, a, as, as the people of Lincolnshire, to keep ourselves fit and healthy and to ask for the support to keep ourselves fit and healthy. Another really important area to look at is, is changes. Uh, which way is it going? And I'll come on to that in a minute. So, so that's a little bit more detail on those. But if you look at the change since 1990, you can see that we've done a really good job with ischemic heart disease. It's still number one, but it's actually reduced by 60% in terms of its the, the amount of um, dallies. Um, but lower back pain has gone up by a fifth, by 20%. And so is COPD. Alzheimer's is, is gone up by fit more than 50%. And diabetes, which is predominantly type 2, predominantly a function of an unhealthy weight, has gone up by 25%. So you can what it starts to show is where we need to be looking. Same sort of thing for years of life lost and years living with disability. I won't go through in those details. Um, I think I'll do one or two more slides and then I'll stop to make sure I hit the time and give us plenty of time for conversation. Um, this is an interesting slide because it shows my age band. I, I realise it's probably really small on your screens, um, but the key thing to notice here is if you go, if we go into this middle bit, this is um, musculoskeletal disorders. So as you would expect, very tiny in our teenagers and below, starts to get a bit bigger, 
But once you get to about 30, it is at least the biggest area, equal biggest area. And then as you go right the way through from 30 up to 85, really, it is the single biggest block of values. And I would argue do not deal with it well at all. And especially from the you know 45 to 75 year olds, massively the biggest block. We've got males on this side, females on that side, um, but we don't deal with it properly. And the second, uh, I'm purposefully on red, um, is mental health or mental disorders. Again, after MSK, probably the second biggest single block. We've got neuro neurological diseases, really, really important, but that's the third biggest block. So it shows us a different, a different way to look at the data. Um, so what's causing it? Well, this is where there are no surprises. Smoking, high blood pressure. Well, high blood pressure in and of itself is, is just an indicator and we can treat it, but we've got to find it first before we can treat it. Uh, high body mass index, uh, high fasting plasma glucose is a driver for diabetes and high cholesterol. So, so the, the causes are not particularly surprising, but what they lead to are, um, I won't do the risk factor, I'll just finish on this. If we look at, if we go back to the three domains of public health, we've got um, health protection, health improvement and healthcare services. Um, I've got a job to make sure that I get our NHS set up to deal with all those problems. But I've also got a bigger job to stop them having to deal with the problems in the first place. And we can see all of the evidence that if you, if we could turn physical activity into a pill, it would be a wonder drug. It would be the wonder drug. It has a massive impact in terms of reducing heart risk, in terms of improving mental well-being. It actually improves your T cell response. And if you are fit and healthy in your older ages, you will recover fit quicker and you'll almost certainly have a better, for example, COVID immunity response because you're more physically active. It covers everything. It's a magic, magic thing. Um, but we do not have enough people taking enough physical activity in Lincolnshire. I'm going to pause there because uh, then we've got 20 minutes for a conversation and I'll also mute myself and I'll stop sharing. Derek, that was brilliant. Many thank yous for that, for opening up this uh, debate. Um, I'm going to hand over to any others who have questions first. I have some here that's been proposed by others, but I'm happy to take any questions from others first. Perhaps if I could, could try and start, Clive, with a fairly wide one. Uh, Derek, as a group, we have tried to structure our activity around three broad themes of business, community and education. If we were trying to promote better health, is there any one of those particular areas you think would have the biggest bang for our buck? So um, if you look at the, the evidence the literature around, around my domain, um, the biggest driver of uh, well-being, good health, is your income. It's quite blunt, but it's true. Biggest driver of your income is the job that you do. Biggest driver of the job that you do is your education. So education and industry business are absolutely fundamental to good health and well-being. I think the, the challenge there is that a, a lot of people in my job, um, I get told off for this by my peers. I'm, very, I'm, I'm quite a practical sort of person. I like to get into the things that I think I can influence. Um, and whilst I work with politicians day in, day, day out, really good relationship, I'm the director of public health. I'm not the economic regen director. Um, so anything I can do to support better economic regeneration, especially in down the East Coast or in, in parts of Lincoln or Boston or, or South Holland that have particular challenges, then, then I'm happy to do. But that's really where we've got to focus as a society to make sure that children and young people are getting the best education, especially those children and young people who are in the most deprived areas, because that's how we'll balance out the health inequality debate. I can do it to some extent the other end, make sure that people who don't access services from the more deprived communities do access services better or quicker, 
but generally those bigger determinants I think is is out with my role but it's something I'm fundamentally interested in. Thank you thank you thank you for that. Um, anybody else for a moment? Yeah yes it, uh, Cliff here I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of questions please one from Mark Fenty who we're representing because he's actually been trying to log in <laughs> Uh, well, unfortunately, can't can't get in. Uh, uh, as the other members of the uh, UNA know, we work closely with Mark in a charity, and Mark's very interested in the social prescribing side. And he was very keen on on activating this interest. It, I think the charity is a licensed screen gym, but he was saying that he finds the uh, application form for the NHS to become involved very complex it's not something I personally involved in but he was just asking about that and also about is there any way of placing a monetary value on social prescribing because clearly health is the, the, the biggest issue for the for the whole of the country's population and, th and then se secondary to that uh, on a more positive side um, we're working with Mark on on things like diet, and we there will be a, a development um, which will be closely working with the um, UNA for Greater Lincolnshire on, in that we're produce going to be producing medicinal herbs mainly for use in developing countries. And you referred to the differences in diseases between, say, Africa and the and the UK. And hopefully this might be a bit of a source of information specific to this county because we're going to be working at this at a very high level uh, as we go forward. It's just something new. So, but m the main thing was to ask about the social prescribing. Thanks, Cliff. Um, in terms of social prescribing, the I don't know whether everybody's aware, but but the basic idea is that. Um, a lot of NHS time is taken up by people who go to a clinician, often the GP, um, and actually the cause of their illness is not a uh, physical cause, it, it's something else. And therefore the GP can't really do a lot apart from listen. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, obviously important that that person has some who will listen to them but it's not the most effective or efficient way to do it. So social prescribing is about trying to, um, rather than prescribe a drug or, or something else, is to help that person get the, the support that they need, but within a community setting. And it's often a, a voluntary or a community uh, agency that will provide that support. So um, the theory is great. Uh, our GP practices are starting to get um, what they're calling social prescribers. They're getting somebody within the practice or sometimes a group of practices who really understand this. And if the GP thinks that the patient in front of them um, would benefit from that social prescribing, they will refer on to that social prescriber. But that's just another person. The, the key thing is how do we connect that social prescriber up with all of the different for want of a better phrase, third sector organisations in the area who could help that individual that um, will... So it comes back, I think, to Bert's point about community. How do we connect people to their community? Ideally, we do that at a community level and the individual doesn't need to go to the NHS in the first place. But if they do go to the NHS, can we get them back into a community, get, get them back into a support network? So the theory is great, the practicality is a nightmare because um, clinicians are not used to this sort of thing. They, they, the, the, um, I know this is being recorded, so I'll probably get told off by some of my GP friends, but the two ways to get a GP to do something differently are pay them to do it differently or make their life easier. And if you can do one or the other, then we get it. And that's why we've called them social prescribers, because then we can talk to GPs about your referral pathway because they like that, they like those sort of languages. Your referral path, pathway for this person is to your social prescriber and then actually into a knitting club or into a, a, a dance session, maybe not at the moment, but in the future, or into a cycling club or into a walking club uh, or into a book club. You know, and 
I, I use all those examples on purpose, they tend to be clubs, they tend to be local support mechanisms. And if that if that's done in the right way and the person feels connected, GP doesn't see them again. Brilliant. And, and that's that's the key bit. Now the, the, the specific uh, cliff about the um, the forms is not something I, I have any authority over, I'm afraid. Um, the, the best thing to do there would be to um, just email the clinical commissioning group. Uh, there's a if you just just get um, Lincolnshire CCG, just Google it. There's a general inquiries there, and it will go through to the right place. I suspect, although I'm not sure because I'm not that close to the operational bit of it, it will be a national NHS England form that has to be filled in, um, and we will need to move away from that so that we get. A much easier uh, pathway for people and ideally we don't get them going through the gp in the first place we get them connected up with a community level thank you derek thank you. Uh, thank you very Caroline, much. i think you had a question sorry yeah sorry um yeah derek thank you that was really really interesting um you mentioned the, the the parable, which I'm assuming was going to be the the prevention and the the um, upstream approach, um, which I'm a great fan of because, um, as you say, there's there's so much goes into what's wrong with people rather than than looking to see what caused it. But I just wonder, and particularly having gone through COVID recently if there is going to be any learning and any push to get more public health added to the curriculum to try and influence and teach and embed things in our younger generation because they're, they're the adults of tomorrow they're the ones who are often really really good influencers um and you know can actually help us long term maybe not you know in, in the short term but you know what one of one of the things that always fascinates me is that we have to in health teach adults things which we shouldn't have to do them you know even down to how to wash their hands it you know it's 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 very frustrating when we should be teaching those children diet, exercise, how to cook, um, you know, how, how to make healthy choices and, you know, stop smoking, you know, they, they can influence parents. Um, I just wondered if there was any, any way that that is being considered in the long term. Um, I, thanks, Caroline. Yes, is a short answer. Uh, I think public health uh, has never been as high on the agenda as it is now. And, and but the, the very short but direct and I think accurate answer is people have to canvass their politicians. They have to say, this, this is more important than dog muck. This is more important than um, our, you know, holes in the, in the road, uh, potholes, etc. Because if our politicians hear that on the doorstep, then they will be feeding that back, whether it's a local councillor, whether it's an MP, whether it's wh wh whomever it is. Um, that then goes through into the mechanisms of government, because that's the only way you're going to change the education system, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, we do really good work with our schools, and they're all absolutely where you are for all the reasons that you would imagine that, you know, people, teachers are teachers for a reason. And they absolutely want to teach their students more than just the core curriculum. Um, but they don't influence that. They get offset in inspections. They have to be able to demonstrate that they have, they have taught what the government tells them to teach. Um, so I think that's the way to do it. We have to come out the back of COVID and not just talk about teaching all of our children and young people how to wash their hands probably because they're pretty good at it now. Um, it's, it's all the wider stuff. But as importantly, we as a society have to recognise that not all children and families are in the same place. You know, I grew up in a working class family. My dad was a bricklayer. My mum uh, packed biscuits in a factory uh, of an evening. Um, so my diet was terrible because it was purely a convenience <laughs> And, and, you know, I, I am the first generation that grew up with Iceland 
and my mum was the mum that went to Iceland. So everything was was in the, from the freezer into the microwave. So I said, she'll kill me if she sees this. Um, but but you know the, that's, that's that's completely true. Mom. Sorry, but that is a fundamental bit. And once you again, as you'll know, I, I, I recognise I'm teaching people to sub exit, but you have to get in early and you have to train people's palates. And once you do that, they don't want the poor foods, the bad foods. With children, young people, their default mode is to run, isn't it? Let's be honest, that's what they do. So how do we facilitate a world where they keep doing that into adulthood? That's the question, rather than flip them back and get them complaining about potholes because they drive everywhere. Well, if you're walking and running, you're not bothered about a pothole. You, these, are, these are the fundamental questions I think as a society we need to address. I, I'm hopeful one of the positives, and there won't be many that come out of COVID, is for people to think a bit differently. People have reconnected with nature a bit better. But the, probably more so in Lincolnshire because we've got such a you know amazing array of, of, of green space on our doorsteps. But that's not true in the middle of Austin. It's not true in the middle of Lincoln, especially if you're in a high-rise flat and you're a single parent with three under five year olds, you just you're not getting out, are you? And and so that creates that that bigger health inequality because there's an inequality fundamentally in their experience. So I think absolutely completely agree with you, Carolyn. Fundamental thing about let's change the curriculum, let's support our children and young people to get better life understanding, better health promoting behaviors. But it's not just that, because whilst you can generally get children and young people to be physically active. Five-year-olds don't go to the shops and buy the shopping, most of them anyway. Five-year-olds don't make the dinner, most of them. So it's an intergenerational thing we've got to tackle. Thank you. Uh, hi, can I ask you a question, please? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me, um, Derek? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, just um, checking with the, um, the UNA website about uh, sustainable development goals and particularly the one about health and the, the screen that came up was the, the concern about COVID so it's a COVID related question and it, it, it's quite depressing really because it, it indicated that a lot of the good work that's happened across the world in in the last decade or so that's being put at risk by COVID in terms of uh, Malaria could increase, uh, child mortality could increase, and, and obviously the things related to COVID. So I just wondered whether you had any sort of view of that, or is, should we be pessimistic about that, or is it something which can be managed? Um, I, I'm, I'm a natural optimist. I think optimists like lawns have more fun. So I, I'm, I'm not going to be pessimistic about things. I'm going to be optimistic. I think... There is no doubt that dealing with a, uh, a disease that didn't exist 18 months ago, just didn't exist, or it was just starting to exist, um, in a global population that therefore had no defence against it, has diverted a huge amount of resource. Uh, you know, I, I, I put the money slide up earlier, didn't I? And you, and you can see the difference. You know, the Department of Health has had to put in um, tens of billions of pounds extra, and that's just one bit of it. That's nothing to do with supporting furloughing or anything like that. So, yeah, it's massively shifted resource uh, to deal with the crisis in front of us. Um, and that will have a knock-on impact, unless, as a society, we decide we want to keep putting more and more resource into a health system and not a sickness system. And again, that comes back to that. But it's a, it's a yeah. choice. In, in our country, at least, we are fortunate that we can make those choices. And different countries make different choices around how they fund and what they fund. And that's, you know, that, that's, we're a democracy. One, one of the challenges that a lot of people in my profession had is that they'd grown up in the NHS and they came into a council and they weren't used to a political environment. I, I, I grew up, actually, in the Department of Health, so I was used to ministers in that, that environment. Fundamentally, we're a democracy. I need to convince my politicians that what I'm saying is the right thing to do, and they need to be hearing it from from the general public. If that's the case, then generally we'll do we'll do good stuff. And I'm I'm massively fortunate. Gen generally, I'm not just saying this. Uh, I'm massively fortunate to work in Lincolnshire. I came back into be a director of public health because Lincolnshire came up. 
because we've got some of the most supportive politicians and we've got a financial approach that means we manage our budgets well, which isn't the case everywhere. Um, and so we can invest and we, are, we have invested. We've now got an integrated lifestyle service in Lincolnshire that we didn't have three years ago when I started. It's called One U Lincolnshire. It helps people, whether you got, you're a smoker or you want to lose weight or you, um, uh, you want to change your diet. Uh, it even helps with people who've got lower levels of alcohol uh, dependency, how to break that. Um, that didn't exist three years ago, but, but our politicians, through the conversations we had, agreed that it was something we should be doing for people. So the, I'm an optimist. Okay. But on, fundamentally, it's about choice. You know, £1.3 billion in Lincolnshire for three quarters of a million people. Whenever anybody tells you there isn't any money to do something, that's not true. It is, we've chosen not to spend money on that. And for me, that's about not making the argument okay. as well as maybe we could do. Okay. I'll get off my soapbox now. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Derek. Again, being on the soapbox is actually good for us because it means that we have uh, someone who's advocating things which we can, if we agree with them, we can actually back up our conversations with other people with. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else with a question that would like to raise? I'm conscious of time here, Pert. Yeah, I've uh, certainly nothing else waiting on the chat function, Clive. So, uh... If you're happy, I'll hand back to you at this point. Okay. Um, I think, is it David going to do a thank after me, is it? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Derek, um, it, just a conversation that we've had in the, uh, our dialogue over the emails. Uh, I was inspired by the ways he responded. That What I've heard tonight is also uh, an inspiration because it's about new thinking and new action, new things we've learned tonight. Um, I was always uh, humbled by some time I spent in Africa working when the concept of Ubuntu was raised. It turns kind of lifestyles on its head. We are, therefore I am. And I think you referred to it in your dialogues today that it's about our community health that generates the dialogues about our individual health rather than being, you know, the, the person that's got a, an illness that wants a plaster to put on it to to make it all right only so thank you for that um and in terms of uh, um uh, final words i'll say them after david thank you okay well well thanks derek it's been really interesting I mean, the things which uh, i didn't understand about how things were uh, distributed and the the issues i mean we, we've you've covered lots of moral and ethical issues there which are really challenging and will continue to challenge us uh, for, for the rest of time. I suppose that dialogue is the one that needs to be opened up so people can can discuss it uh, constructively and uh, beat down all the the sort of um, bad press and the the, uh, the 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 incorrect stories, which uh, which do must have an impact on on public health. Um, I was um, a bit sorry to hear that, and I'm just, just if I get this correct, if if you if you do live a shorter life, then your your dallies um, will increase. Is that right? Yes. So if you if you end up by dying earlier, your dallies will be shorter. Well, I'm a bit sad to hear that your mum might um, actually increase your dallies <laughs> if she hears this uh, this this podcast or or this uh, reference. But I'm sure she'll be. Uh, I'm sure she wouldn't do that really. So, but thank you very much for this evening, uh, and it's been very informative, and I'm sure it'll be very useful uh, on our website. And perhaps we can come back to you in future future time to add more to it. It's a it's an unfinished story. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, and, and with reference to my mum, just to <laughs> just to tie that back, um, but but to come back to the, the fact that. By working along with my dad, the income was great. It gave me opportunities to get an education that I wouldn't have got and fundamentally changed my life course. So, you know, I was using it as an example, but the, the fundamental bit of it is still there, which is that um, because we had a bit more income than we would have had, I had more opportunities, the youngest of four. The only one went to university and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, thanks, Mum. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. So, uh... Brilliant. I think 
<laughs> that was great. Thank you once again. And like David said, perhaps we can come back to you another time. Um, yeah. Just to remind you that our next session is on the 27th of July, and that's about closing the digital divide. We didn't talk about artificial intelligence and health or digital aspects of health. But again, that's another massive area for personal health and as well as community health, I'm sure. So yet again, thank you once again, Derek. And I think we'll close the session tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.